previous class we discussed about the different financial statements and what we have seen the measure whenever we discuss about the financial statements what we have uh, seen that the deposit is the major liability and uh, the investment and the bank credit or bank loans are the major assets for the commercial bank. And we discussed certain issues related to the approaches to the bank lending and as well as uh, uh, the factors which are affecting the deposit base. So, in this particular session we will be discussing about how the commercial bank performance is measured and what are those indicators we use to measure the performance. So, the performance uh, measures are mostly uh, based upon the income statement. So, if you if you minutely observe uh, this uh, particular uh, table, so there are different major items uh, which has been highlighted here. You have the interest income from the loan, then interest expenses because the bank also borrow from other another bank or from RBI they pay the interest. So, your net interest income is nothing but your uh, interest income from interest income minus interest expenses. Then you have some non interest income, you are also providing certain services, you are also investing in the market, you have certain non interest income you can generate out of this. Then your total operating income is equal to your net interest income and the non interest income that will give you the operating income. There are some expenses, overhead expenses, day to day expenses the commercial banks do. They, you also keep some provisions for loans and leases that already we discussed in the previous class and you can also gain or loss in the securities whatever money or whatever stocks and all these things you have invested. And there are pre tax operating income if you want to calculate that is the total operating income minus your uh, overhead expenses minus the provisions for the loss and losses and if there is a gain in terms of the securities whatever you have invested that can be added here. So, that is basically your pre tax operating income then finally, you can pay the tax then the net operating income is nothing but the pre tax operating income minus tax then finally, your net income if you are any kind of extraordinary expenses and all these things if you have uh, then you can deduct that one and finally, your net income of the commercial bank can be measured. So, the this particular table is trying to show that how the net income of the commercial bank is measured because net income is a measure which is uh, mostly used to measure any kind of ratios of. Uh, uh, or any kind of performance measure of any kind of financial organization or any other organization. So, including bank we are much more concerned about how much net income the commercial bank can generate and what are the different sources the income is coming and what are the different avenues through which the expenditures are made. So, after this uh, we can move into that uh, different ratios what the commercial banks use to measure their performance. Like other companies the uh, first and foremost measure is the return on assets. The return on asset means uh, how much uh, how the particular company is able to generate the income out of the assets whatever they have. So, that is why it is nothing but the net income divided by the total assets and if you uh, want to convert in terms of percentage then it is basically multiplied by the 100. So, the one of the uh, most popular used measure for profitability that is your ROI. So, this is a profitability measure, this is a profitability measure. So, any time whenever we uh, use any kind of proxy for the profitability always we try to measure it through the ROI. The first for most important measure or the popular measure for profitability that is the return on assets. Then you, you have the ROI which is return on equity. Equity holders the particular people who invest in that particular bank stocks they are much more concerned about the return on equity. So, what is return on equity? So, the same thing this is your net income upon the total equity capital whatever the company has. So, in the monetary term whatever equity value the company has total amount of equity net income upon the total how that means how this particular net income is distributed among the equity holder that basically is measured through the return on equity. So, net income upon the total equity capital that will give you the return on equity and multiplied by 100 that will give you the percentage. So, that is also is one of the uh, most important performance measure of the 
bank. Uh, so, here what I am trying to say that uh, ROA and ROE return on asset and return on equity these are uh, quite uh, used measure whenever we talk about the performance of a bank or any kind of organization. And there is a relationship between ROA and ROE also, which in our term we call it basically the break even analysis sorry uh, it is it is called the dew point analysis. So, here what basically we are talking about this relationship between ROA and ROE, how it can be measured. Uh, if you see here the net income upon the total equity capital, it can be further further also ex expanded, but here I just uh, wanted to show you that how these two ratios are related. If you see that net income upon total equity capital which is your ROE is nothing but net income by total assets multiplied by total assets by total equity. So, total asset by total equity is nothing but the leverage financial leverage. This is basically nothing but the financial leverage. So, if you have the ROE which is available to you and you have ROE to you, then you can find out your leverage or the financial leverage of the organization or particular bank. So, if you have the financial leverage and ROE, you can find out ROE. So, there is some kind of interlinkage which exists between the uh, different two ratios like ROE and ROA who are the most popular measures for the performance for any kind of organization. Then what is the leverage? It is leverage basically shows the finance risk, financial risk already in the beginning of the sessions we discussed about that. The leverage is basically measures uh, the financial risk of the particular organization. So, the multiplier or the leverage equity multiplier or the leverage multiplied by ROA that can give you the ROE. So, that is the relationship between ROA and ROE in the particular system. Then we can move into the uh, another measures for the banking perspective the one of the most important measure of performance is the net interest margin. So, what is this net interest margin? It is the already we know that what do we mean by the net interest? It is total interest income minus total interest expenses divided by the average earnings assets multiplied by the 100 that can give you the net interest margin or net interest income is nothing but total interest income minus total interest expenses that we have seen in the beginning of the discussion. So, net interest margin is the measure for the banking perspective it may not be applicable for other uh, kind of companies like manufacturing companies and other things, but whenever we analyze the performance of the commercial bank we are much more concerned about the uh, net interest margin percentage because that gives a clear picture that how the commercial bank is able to generate the income and how much expenditure they are making and finally, what is the margin they are maintaining in terms of the net income what they are generating in terms of the interest payments. Then we have another one the provisions for loan loss ratio that is the provisions for loan loss uh, loan losses divided by the total loans. This particular ratio uh, whenever you talk about this, this particular ratio basically shows uh, how the bank is exposed to the different kind of risk. So, mostly the credit risk. The more the credit risk involved of a particular loan, the bank provides more provisions against that particular loan. So, if the provisions are more, this is not a very good sign for the bank. The reason is the provisions are given to avoid any kind of loan losses. So, the, if the probability of loss is more than the amount of provisions allotted to against that loan will be more. So, in that context we should see that what kind of loan the banks are giving the particular loan should be properly assessed and the probability of loss probability of default for that particular loan should be very less. In that context if the probability of loss will be less then the provisions amount will be also less because the provisions is basically the liability for the commercial banks. So, you should expect that amount of uh, money should be less for the system for the bank. So, that is why this is another measure which measures that how far the commercial bank is exposed to the risk. So, that is why provisions for loan loss ratio is also uh, considered as a risk measure for the commercial bank. Then we have a temporary investment ratio. What do we mean by the temporary investment ratio? This is the government securities sold plus the investment securities with maturity of one year or less and the due from the other banks. 
divided by the total loans. So, that basically temporary investment ratio in the sense how much short term securities or very liquid securities we have sold in terms of government securities and as well as the uh, securities which uh, maturity period is less than 1 year or at least uh, or maximum 1 year and what are the dues we have from the other banks and how much loans we have given. That basically a short term view that how far this particular uh, bank is able to liquidate their assets whenever they need against that particular loan whatever they have given. So, that basically says you that whether the bank's liquidity is better or not or at the time of requirement what the, whether the bank is able to generate certain kind of revenue to fulfill the requirements of the customer or not. So, that is what basically we call it the total uh, temporary investment ratio of the commercial bank. So, that is another measure always we use as a performance measure for the uh, commercial banks. Then we can move into uh, some other measures. The other measures are the volatility liability dependency ratio. This is one of the new measure what the banks use that is the total volatile liabilities minus temporary investments divided by the total, uh, total or the net loans and the leases into 100. That means, it is shows that how far the liability dependency ratio is volatile. So, here you have the total volatile liabilities, volatile liabilities in the sense the possible particular asset whose asset value or liability value is highly volatile and how much liquidity we have that basically measures through the temporary investments and how much loans and leases we have made in that particular time period. So, we have to see if this particular liabilities are highly volatile the value is frequently changing and to fulfill that particular gap how much uh, investments we are we have made in terms of the liquid assets. So, that basically provide how far the bank is prone to the liquidity risk. The volatility liability dependency ratio is again related to a liquidity risk of the particular bank whether the bank is liquid enough to fulfill any kind of requirements if the particular liabilities whatever they have they are basically highly volatile. So, for example, the current liabilities are highly volatile, we have no idea that when the particular current account will be withdrawn. Like that you can identify some of the liabilities what the banks have, they may change uh, frequently or there are certain kind of certain jumps at the time of or any very specific time period. So, to avoid this kind of uh, problem or any kind of uh, situation which can be adversely affect the bank's reputation and other things the banks should have enough liquid assets with them which basically measured through the temporary investments. So, that investment is good enough to fulfill that particular fluctuations which is happening in terms of those liabilities or not that is basically measured through the volatility liability dependency ratio. Then we have the rupee gap ratio this is basically this interested sensitive assets minus the interested sensitive liabilities divided by the total assets. You see whatever assets the banks have all the assets are not interested sensitive and all liabilities also are not interested sensitive. So, if you if you can uh, divide those assets the assets which are interested sensitive for example, the fixed assets they are not interested sensitive the equities are not interested to some extent they are sensitive because their fluctuations are there because the loans and as well as the deposits they are the most interested sensitive uh, assets and liabilities. Then we have to see that what is the gap between the interest sensitive assets and interest sensitive liabilities against the total assets whatever we have. So, if it is the interested sensitive assets are more are interested liability against this interested sensitive liabilities accordingly the bank has to adopt different kind of strategy to minimize their risk. So, that is basically uh, the major uh, concept of asset liability management of the commercial bank. So, here we have to see that what is the difference between these two and accordingly we have to def uh, define that how what kind of investment or what kind of portfolio the bank should make by that this kind of risk can be managed. So, that also is considered as a performance measure for the commercial bank. Then another uh, very straightforward or linear measure always or the simple measure also bank can use that is the net loans to the total loans. How much loans they have given against the uh, net loans in the sense 
how much loan can be recovered from that particular what is the probability that the loan can be recovered and how much total loan they have given. So, in that context they have see that key whether the uh, loans which are basically given the bank is able to recover these loans at a particular point of time or what is the probability that the default will be relatively less. So, these are the different measures which are used uh, for the or act, uh, uh, we can say that uh, uh, popular measures which are used to, to measure the performance of the commercial bank. Then, then we can uh, move to to other measures uh, other kind of issues related to this performance that is your non performing asset, which is uh, quite popular in today's context, because there are huge debate the non performing assets are increasing in a very rapid uh, manner. The growth rate of the NPS for the public sector banks are increasing and uh, particularly uh, that is a worrisome matter for the whole banking system and as well as the financial system, because uh, those kind of uh, problem in the instability in the banking or high risk in the banking because the NPS are increasing that can spill over to the functioning of the other markets because the markets are highly integrated. So, in this point of time we have to always ensure we have to see that what is the probability or what is the causes of NPS and sometimes we see that the definition of NPS is also affecting that uh, uh, whether the NPS should be more or less because since 2014 this concept of definition or the definition of uh, NPS have changed and as well as we have seen that there are some other factors also responsible for the NPS. So, here what we are trying to see first of all let us check what do we mean by the NPU, what is, what is the meaning of the non performing asset and then we can move into the factors probable factors which is responsible for the NPS in the system. So, if you talk about NPA, the NPA is basically a, uh, when the asset can be converted into NPA, when the interest or the installment of principal remain overdue for a period period of more than 90 days in respect of the loan. So, whenever the either the interest is not paid for 3 months or the if at all the principal, principal amount also should be repaid, the principal amount is not repaid for 3 months then that particular loan of the commercial bank will be considered as the non performing asset. Either interest or the part of the principal which are supposed to be paid within 3 months or which should supposed to be paid periodically for every month basis, but continuously for 3 months if it is not paid then we can call that particular asset is a, is a non performing asset according to the Reserve Bank of India guidelines. But if there is an agricultural loan and the loan is uh, granted for a short duration crops, then the particular definition is little bit different. Then here if it is a short duration crop, then if the installment of the principal or interest thereon remains overdue for two crop seasons and a loan guaranteed for the long duration crops will be treated as NPA. Overdue for the two crop seasons and a loan guaranteed for a long duration crop will be treated as NPA if the installment of the principal or interest remains overdue for the one crop season. If it is a short term duration crop, then it will be considered as an NPA if the interest or the principal is not repaid for the two crop seasons. But if it is a long duration crop loan, then the particular amount will be considered as an NPA if the particular amount is not paid for the one crop season. Then more or less the crop season is more or less same uh, 3 months to 4 months. So, in that context they consider the crop season is the parameter to define the NPA whenever they can analyze about the agricultural loan. But whenever other type of loans we consider either it is a housing loan or it is a vehicle loan or it is a personal loan or any other loan, there the NPAs are basically defined on the basis of the days uh, of non repayment of the interest or the principal. So, that is basically 90 days. So, this is the way the NPA in the Indian context is defined according to RBI guidelines. So, then let us see that whenever we are talking about NPA then obviously, there are classification of the assets. The assets are classified into different ways 
whenever we consider the NPA or we define the NPA for a particular commercial bank. Then how the assets are classified? If you see the commercial banks, the commercial banks assets are basically classified into four types and these are standard asset, substandard asset, doubtful asset and the loss asset. What do you mean by the standard asset? The standard asset is basically one which does not disclose any problem and which does not carry more than normal risk attached to the business. That means, they are not the NPA. So, any loan which has been taken and the loan is repaid periodically, the interest is paid periodically, the principals are paid periodically, then obviously that kind of asset is basically considered as the standard asset. Uh, apart from the normal credit risk and other risk which are already measured by the commercial bank, the other type of problems does not arise with respect to that kind of asset or that kind of loans, they are basically considered as the standard asset. But whenever we talk about the soft standard asset, then soft standard asset is basically those assets if it remained as NPA for a period less than or equal to 12 months. It will be converted into NPA if it is not paid for 3 months, but if it remained that in that category for consecutive 12 months, then we can call it it is a soft standard asset. So, that means, the particular value or particular uh, asset what the commercial bank has, it has become an NPA. Once it has become an NPA, then in that category it remains for one year, then we consider that particular uh, asset is the substandard asset. But whenever we talk about the doubtful asset, the doubtful asset is basically that asset, where this particular asset is required to be classified as doubtful if it has remained NPA for more than 12 months. If in again it is considered or it is defined as an NPA for more than 12 months, we call them the uh, uh, doubtful asset. So, remember this is for more than 12 months, this is equal to 12 months. Up to one year, it is considered as the substandard asset, more than 12 months, it is considered as the doubtful asset. Then whenever it is a final one is a loss asset, the loss asset is one where the loss has been identified by the bank or the internal or external auditors or by the cooperation department or by the Reserve Bank of India inspection, but the amount has not been written off wholly or partly. At the time of auditing, some of the loans amount can be written off for any particular reasons due to the government or some uh, because of uh, with a proper approval from RBI with a proper approval from the government some amount of loan can be written off. But the loan is particular particular kind of asset is a doubtful asset. So, again at any point of time it is consecutively for a longer period of time it is considered it, it remained as an NPA, but even if it is remained as an NPA still it cannot be written off there is no such kind of guidelines, such kind of clues or such kind, such kind of reasons by that the particular loan can be written off. In that particular point of time, that particular loan is considered as a loss asset. So, this has to be, the loss has to be identified by the bank or internal or external auditors or by the cooperation department. So, these are the different types of assets whatever we have. So, then uh, already I told you that uh, uh, what are those reasons for NPA? If you talk about the reasons for NPA, uh, there are two things you have to keep in the mind. One is your ability to pay and another one is your willingness to pay. Somebody is uh, able to pay which the bank is able to really measure that. So, because of that they try that okay, the future cash flow this particular person or particular individual or particular company can generate, they can pay the money and for some reason they are not able to pay because maybe they could not generate that revenue over the period of time. Another is willingness to pay which is mostly driven by the behavioral issues that if somebody might have the revenue, but they are not willing to pay. So, that aspect is very difficult to measure, it is very difficult to measure because how we can measure that whether really the bank is able to generate the 
uh, or the recover the money from that person who has money, but they are not ready to pay. And second thing is whenever you talk about the NPA, their NPA there are various reasons. The NPA is sometimes the uh, credit assessment of the loan is not proper. Sometimes the we can see that the economic conditions also creates the problem because the companies or other organizations may not able to create that kind of revenue. There are some other factors like farm loans and all these things, farmer loans and all these things, the monsoon and other things are also the responsible factor. There are many factors which can create, but here, here I just wanted to highlight broadly there are two factors, the factors which are affecting ability to pay, what we are discussing which are the tangible factors and there are some factors which are related to willingness to pay and if it is because of the willing not willingness to pay is the factor, then it is very difficult to recover that loan because the person is able to pay, but they are not willing to pay. So, these are the things what uh, very important from this perspective or uh, these are the new dimensions what always we should consider whenever we are providing the loans to any kind of customers. Then we have a capital base which is your total capital, uh, this is your total capital, uh, total capital means total equity capital and the debt or the bond divided by the risk weighted assets and it should be more than 9 percent in the context of India according to Basel norms. So, here if you see your total capital is a tier 1 and tier 2 capital and uh, tier 1 capital is related to the share capital and the resorption surplus and tier 2 capital is consisting of the subordinated debt or the equity capital. That particular ratio this risk weighted asset which are risk weight are given on the basis of different kind of risk what the bank can face. So, that is basically measures the stability of the bank. This ratio is measure the stability, we will discuss more about this whenever we discuss about the vessel norms. I have just introduced this particular concept, but the discussion on capital base will be more whenever we discuss about the vessel norms uh, in the following sessions. Uh, then we have another issue you see the performance or everything depends upon the retail business mostly in India. There are varieties of retail business has gone off or grown off in the Indian context and what are those factors which affect the retail business in India, retail banking in India? Economic prosperity, changing consumers demography which indicate that vast potential for growth in the consumption because people taste and preference are changing because of the demographic change. Technological innovations, anytime online trading, online shopping is very easy, there is no need to go to the marketplace that increases your consumption, that is why it increases the importance of the banking. Decline in the uh, treasury income of the banks, sometimes because of this thing uh, the income of the banks create affected. Retail loans have put comparatively less provisioning burden on the banks. You see that uh, retail loans whenever uh, we are taking this uh, loan credit assessment policy of the bank is relatively more robust. That is why the credit risk of the bank is relatively less. So, that is why the provisioning also increases uh, or provisioning declines for the banks, but banks are not keeping much provisions against this any kind of retail loans. So, the because the appraisal policy is relatively very stringent and they have more information about the retail investors with the thorough monitoring. Uh, process. These are the different factors which drives this retail business in India and commercial banks play a very significant role in that particular process. Further we will be discussing on the uh, other issues related to the Basel norms and as well as the different how the particular commercial banks manage their risk and what are those different type of risk the commercial banks. Please go through this particular uh, references uh, for this particular session. Thank you.